Hebrews chapter 10 is where we are this evening. We are in the midst, as I have said before, of what I believe to be the crux of the matter concerning the book of Hebrews. The very core, if you want to call it that, uh, that is the heart of what the unnamed writer is uh, trying to drive at. Of course, I've already told you before that I believe that the author of Hebrews is Luke and Paul is behind what is being written even though Paul did not literally put pen to paper as it were I do believe Paul had a great influence on whoever it was who wrote this and just so happens I believe it to be Luke because of the type of Greek that's used similarities between this and the Gospel of Luke and several other things still what this is in Hebrews chapters 7, 8, 9, 10 is really what the Hebrews writer and the entire epistle is driving at. This is the crux of the matter. So chapter 10 begins, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with the, those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. And that is a very, very interesting verse. It is talking about the law of Moses, of course. It's a shadow, a shadow of the good, literally. The good to come, a shadow of the good to come. And not the very image, or icona, the very image of the things. So it's not what God fully intended. It simply is uh, a forerunner, for lack of a better term, a forerunner of what was intended. And notice the phraseology here. Can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, the King James puts it, or talking about all the sacrifices that were offered up during the law of Moses, during the time of uh, the laws um, being in force. All those sacrifices that were offered, all of it could never make the comers perfect or teleosi, uh, complete, um, spiritually complete is really what he's driving at. Um, in other words, those sacrifices were not quite what was needed. And he gives a reason. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. His point was if those sacrifices, all those sacrifices that were made from the time of the institution of the law of Moses all the way to the time that it was taken out of the way, which point he's going to make here shortly. If all of those sacrifices were effective, then why were they continually offered daily? Why wasn't there just a sacrifice made and that was it and you didn't have to make any more? Because of the type of sacrifice that was being made during that period, during the law of Moses. In other words, it was not effective to take away sin. And that's his very point in verse 3. In those sacrifices, literally in those, implied because the King James has a sacrifice as there is in italics that's added by the translators. In those, speaking of the sacrifices, a remembrance again of sins or made of sins every year. So in other words, all these sacrifices served to do was to remind the people that by the way, you have sins and those sins have to be purged. But it is a year to year to year to year purging. In other words, you can't just say, well, okay, the high priest has made the offering for us in the most holy place for, all, for his sins, for the sins of the people. We don't have to worry about, any, about that anymore. Uh-uh. It's every year. It's continual. And so verse 4, here's the key point. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. 
There is the problem. There's the problem with the law of Moses. All of that blood that was offered up, all those sacrifices were animal sacrifices. The blood of bulls, the blood of goats, the blood of all of those animals. You know, at the Passover in Jerusalem, according to Jeremiah, one ancient writer, he said that the priests would, quote, wade up to their ankles in blood, end quote. Now, that's a little bit of an overstatement. Uh, what his point was, there was so much blood being uh, sacrificed and being offered up that it was just all over the place. Think about it. It wasn't a very clean place to be there at the temple. And prior to that, the tabernacle, when all those sacrifices were offered up, if you've ever been involved in cleaning animals and dressing animals, you know exactly what that's about. There's a lot of blood involved. It's a messy, messy thing. And indeed, this was a very messy thing that they had to be involved in. The Levites were busy. They were not lazy people. The Levites were busy if they were doing what they were supposed to do every day of the week, but especially on the Sabbath, that was their busiest day of the week. And then the Day of Atonement was the, by far the busiest day of the year for them because of all the sacrifices that they were making, culminating in the Day of Atonement or in the uh, sacrifice made by the high priest. All of that blood, all of that blood spilled, all of that blood shed, and none of it could take away just one sin, not one sin. Now, before we go further, we need to point out that if an individual lived and died faithfully under the Mosaic law, that individual was forgiven to completely of his or her sins by the future sacrifice of Jesus Christ, looking forward, as the Hebrews writer is going to point out, to that future ultimate sacrifice. So it is then said about Jeremiah and Elizabeth, or Zechariah, I should say, Zechariah and Elizabeth in Luke 1, that is the father and mother of John the Immerser, John the Baptizer, it is said that these two individuals were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Now hold on for a moment. They were living, and, and, uh, uh, living under the law of Moses. That was the law under which they served. And yet Luke says, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that this couple were righteous in the sight of God. I thought no one could be righteous in the law, under the law of Moses. Yes, you could. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of, of the Lord blameless. You mean they kept the law of Moses flawlessly? No. One person, only one person kept the law of Moses flawlessly, and that was Jesus Christ. He made no mistakes, committed no sin. But the point is, Zacharias and Elizabeth were faithful to the law of Moses. And because of that, they were declared by the Holy Spirit through the pen of Luke to be righteous. And they were blameless. That is, they were not habitually involved in sin. So it could be said of those who were faithful to God. And as you're going to see in Hebrews the 11th chapter, there are those that are described there from the Old Testament, uh, both men and women, who are heroes and heroines of faith. These individuals were faithful, even though they lived under patriarchy and they lived under the law of Moses. But here his point in chapter 10 is while these individuals were living under that law, not one sin was totally taken away and remembered no more. He continues, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Quoting here from Psalm 40, verse 6. When he comes into the world, who is the he? It's Christ. It's the pre-existent Christ. It is the pre-existent word that is described in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Down further in that chapter it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, here the Hebrews writer quotes from Psalm 40 and says, A body you have prepared me. Prior to the incarnation of Christ into the world, he was the pre-existent Christ. He was the pre-incarnate word. Then the body was made. The body being the body of Jesus. And that's when he became Jesus the Christ. 
The name Jesus was a very common name. Joshua is, a, is what Jesus comes from. Very common name, just like the name John this day and time is a very common name, or the name David, or any other kind of common name for an individual. Jesus was a common name, but the difference was this was Jesus the Christ. He was different because he was and is the Son of God, and this body had been prepared for him. Verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. You see the point? See what this is getting, what this is driving toward? All these sacrifices that have been offered up, all these animals that have been offered, had never once taken away a sin, but this Christ who is going to come into the world comes in with a body prepared for him. For what purpose? Verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume or the roll of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, speaking of Christ, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. You see, the Hebrews writer here explains what he's just said. He said the reason he said this is because he's coming to do God's will. What is God's will? To take away the first, the first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and to establish the second. But how would that be accomplished? That would be accomplished because of that body that had been prepared for him, verse 10. By the which will, notice that word, the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Here he's driving at the fact that Christ freely offered himself. No one forced Jesus Christ against his will to do what he did on the cross. He said himself several times, I lay down my life, I take it up again. No man has control over that. He himself did that on his own free will. Now when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed earnestly to the Father, sweat becoming his drops of blood, and said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What was he talking about when he said the cup? He wasn't talking about the death that he would die on the cross because he, everything he had been doing up to that point had been focused on that very thing. He had told his disciples clearly how he must, must suffer many things the chief priests and scribes. He must be killed. He must be raised again the third day. He himself wanted to do this. It wasn't the death that he would die, that cup. The cup he was praying to be taken away from him was the cup of intense pain and anguish he knew exactly what he was going to be going through on that cross he wanted to die for the sins of the world he just if there was any possible way to take away the intensity of the pain and agony if it be possible that's the cup he was praying to be taken away from him but then he said nevertheless not my will but thine be done he was determined, bound and determined to sacrifice himself. We are sanctified, it says there in verse 10. We are made holy, if you want to put it that way, through the offering of the body. There's that body he had referred to earlier from Psalm 40. Through the body of Jesus Christ once, and the word is added there, the words are added there for all. And that's really the meaning of that word in the original text. Once for all sacrifice. Once for all time. Never to be repeated. Jesus' sacrifice is unique above all other sacrifices in that. In verse 11, he further highlights the difference. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Remember, all those sacrifices that were instituted in the law of Moses, all those offerings that were offered up, not one of them took away a single sin. But this man, or he, after or when, he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. 
It was done. His sacrifice was made. He was raised from the dead on the third day triumphantly by the power of God. He ascended to the Father, as we are told in Acts chapter 1, as prophesied by Daniel in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, when he saw the night visions, and one likened to the Son of Man came in the clouds of heaven, and there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That was his coronation. Why did Jesus tell the apostles to wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high? He had been with them for 40 days after his crucifixion and his resurrection, and now he told them to wait, and they waited for 10 days in Jerusalem. Why? Because Jesus had been away from heaven for 33 years approximately. And he was going back to where he belonged and was going to be triumphantly received by the host of heaven. He was going to be coronated king, crowned king of kings and lord of lords. So, 10 days, very, very appropriate to welcome this king of kings back into heaven itself. So, he's back in heaven, sits down on the right hand of the throne of God because this sacrifice is it. No more that must be offered. From henceforth, verse 13, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Very interesting phraseology in that verse. Till he makes his enemies his footstool. Where else do you find a similar phrase like that? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, those that claim that uh, everything has already been fulfilled in AD 70 would laugh and scoff at that. But yet, Paul's language couldn't be clearer in 1 Corinthians 15. And the language here could not be clearer. When would the enemies of Christ be made his footstool at the end of time? That's when it would happen. Because the enemies of Christ still are working against the cause of Christ to this day. You look around you and you can see Satan busy at work. He's not been subdued. He's not been made the footstool of Christ. Uh, and his uh, minions have not been made his footstool yet. But it will take place at the end of time. This is devastating premillennialism. He is now sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Premillennialism says he hasn't yet sat, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's not yet reigning because the church is an afterthought. The church is a stopgap measure because the kingdom has not yet been, fulfilled, been uh, established. But yet the Hebrews writer has nothing to do with that. He is now reigning until his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, notice verse 14, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. One offering. We are made complete. We are perfected. That word perfected there in verse 14 is from the word teleos, a form of the word, uh, the root word teleos, meaning make complete. Uh, and that is indeed the case in the offering of Jesus Christ. Those of us who were made holy, set apart, is what sanctification means. Uh, that sacrifice makes it possible. Verse 15, whereof the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, or into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Once again, he quotes from Jeremiah 31. He had done that previously in Hebrews 8. Now he refers to it one more time here to emphasize the fact that these sins are taken away completely. As had been foretold, prophesied, back in Jeremiah 31, it is fulfilled in the once for all sacrifice of Christ. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. How in this world could anyone feasibly, plausibly make the claim that the law of Moses and the law of Christ were coexisting with the approval of God for some 40 years after the gospel was preached in Acts 2. And yes, that's what the 8070 70 advocates seem to want us to believe. 
In other words, you have a situation where for 40 years, from AD 30 to AD 70, you have the priesthood of Levi and the priesthood of Christ operating side by side with the legitimacy of God until Titus sacked Jerusalem in AD 70 and destroyed the temple. And it was then that the law of Moses was completely taken out of the way. That's spiritual adultery, plain and simple. The fact is it was taken out of the way when the gospel was preached following the sacrifice of Jesus which took the law out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and then the will of Christ was probated on the day of Pentecost when it was preached in its fullness for the first time. And the gospel spread like wildfire for the first 40 years. Well, the fact is, the only priesthood that was legitimate, that is legitimate following the sacrifice of Christ is the high priesthood of Melchizedek, which Jesus, of course, is. He is high priest, and that's what he affirms here in uh, this next few verses. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest or the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high or a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true or pure heart in full assurance or fullness of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Interesting passage. He says, we have boldness because of this great sacrifice, this once for all sacrifice. We have boldness to enter into the holy place. We are priests, male and female in the church. All of us are priests under the great high priest. We have boldness to enter into that holy place by the blood of Jesus, by this new and living way, which he has consecrated through the veil, and he specifies that this veil, in this sense, is symbolizing his flesh, and having a high or great priest over the house of God, speaking of Christ, over the church, let us, that's for the Hebrews that he was writing to, and the, or Hebrew Christians, and that's for us as well. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith you don't have to doubt when you go to God in prayer when you pillow your head at night or when you wake up in the morning or any time that you pray to God you don't have any reason to doubt that God hears your prayer not one reason to doubt it because of that great sacrifice if you are a child of God saved by the blood of Christ through obedience to the gospel when you pray you can be assured that God hears your prayer now if you're in habitual sin and if you're in open rebellion to God God will not hear your prayer but if you are striving to be what you need to be as a child of God and you pray fervently to God God hears you and God will answer your prayer maybe not in the way that you think Maybe not the way you expect, but God will answer your prayer. We can have that fullness, that assurance of faith. Notice, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That references, that harkens back to the blood. The blood that was sprinkled on the law of Moses and sprinkled upon the people. That blood that Jesus shed purges our conscience. Just as it purged all the things that were connected with the law of Moses, we are purged by that blood that was shed and our bodies washed with pure water. Washed. That's a reference to baptism. Plain and simple. Referencing back to when we obeyed the truth initially. Baptism is part of God's plan. Oh. Uh, Bless his heart, I had a teacher when I was in high school who is not a member of the church. He was a preacher, very great person, uh, still a good friend to this day, but he was fully immersed in his denominational teaching, and every once in a while, he would divert from his uh, planned study, and he would go off into religious subjects and open it up for discussion. He couldn't do that today, but if he were still teaching, he wouldn't care. That's the kind of person he was. He wanted to discuss things of interest morally and religiously. Good man. 
But yet he affirmed in that class that baptism had nothing at all to do with salvation. He quoted, Paul said, Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel. Well, we know from that context there in 1 Corinthians, he himself, Paul says later on, that he baptized several people. He didn't even know all the people he had baptized. And he also, this same apostle, affirms in Romans 6 that we're buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. He makes it very clear where bapti what baptism does. It purges us through the blood of Christ. And so this right here in verse 22, our bodies washed with pure water, has referencing that when we initially obeyed the truth. Uh, because of what Christ did, that makes it all possible. And it's my response to what Christ has done in his appointed way that contacts me with the blood of Jesus Christ and continually contacts me with his shed blood. Let us hold fast the profession or confession of our faith or hope without wavering for he is faithful that promised. Here's an exhortation to be faithful. Because of all of this, let us be faithful. Verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Let's stir up each other. You know, people are stirring up each other these days in ways that are bad. There's enough stirring up and provoking to bad things. It's easy to provoke somebody to anger, isn't it? It's easy to provoke somebody to get upset and stir up somebody where there's all in, in a lather over something that is absolutely means nothing at all. We see a lot of that today. Well, the Hebrews writer is saying, let us consider one another to provoke Yes, we need to provoke each other, but provoke to love and provoke unto good works. Let's utilize our energies in a positive way is what he's saying. Let's provoke each other to do things that are good and right and, and positive and wholesome. Verse 25, very familiar passage. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another... And so much the more as you see the day approaching. How many times have you heard that passage quoted in the pulpit? How many times have you heard that verse read? How often have you heard that verse cited by your parents or by your grandparents or by your preacher or by elders and deacons? Oh, you've heard a lot over the years. And it's appropriate to occasionally, periodically I should say, Remind ourselves of not forsaking the assembling. Notice the assembling, not the assembly. Sometimes we misquote that and say not forsaking the assembly. Uh-uh. Forsaking the assembling. There's a big difference. In other words, when we gather together to worship at the set times, let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Notice as the manner of some is. At that early stage in the church, this epistle written probably in the 60s, there were already brethren who were habitually missing the services of the church. Imagine that. People are people, aren't they? Now, what are we talking about when we say forsaking the assembling? We're talking about uh, willful neglect. When you know you could be present and you choose not to be. We used to call it laying out of service. That's what we need to start calling again. Laying out of service. Uh, we're not talking about when somebody is sick, when a loved one has major surgery, uh, when there are circumstances beyond our control where we can't attend the services of the church. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about someone who's incapacitated and cannot physically be present. We're not talking about those circumstances. We're talking about somebody that just deliberately and willfully chooses not to be with the saints. Many years ago in a place where I was preaching, I was uh, criticized because they said I was preaching too much about Hebrews 10.25 in the pulpit. Well, I wasn't. But uh, I was mentioning it so often that these individuals said, you're, you're focusing on that too much. I said, well, if y'all start attending, I'd stop focusing on it. But still, that didn't go over that well either. But still, the fact is, Hebrews 10.25 warns us about this. And we can't. Notice verse 26. For if we sin willfully, 
After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Notice he says that in connection with forsaking the assembly. Now, there's been a lot of focus on that, the day approaching phrase in verse 25. What is the day? Is it the Lord's day that's upcoming? Is it the day that you meet? I believe that's the day of judgment he's talking about. The day approaching. The impending day of judgment that's to come. So much the more as you see the day approaching. There are those that would say it's the destruction of Jerusalem. I don't believe that. I believe this is the day of judgment he's referring to. And the reason is given here in verses 26 and 27 the following. Willful sin. When you keep on committing the same sin over and over and over, there's no more sacrifice for sins. You've displayed an attitude, a disposition of heart that is unwilling to repent, unwilling to change. He that despised or set at naught Moses' law died without mercy or compassion under, or in the word of, two or three witnesses. Quoting or alluding to two passages, Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 19. Of mu how much sore punishment, how much sore punishment suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace how much worse will it be for a child of God to go back into sin I cannot for the life of me see how someone could affirm that once you are saved you are always saved in light of this passage alone in light of Hebrews 6 that we read uh, before Hebrews 6 4 through 6 in light of 2nd Peter 2 20 through 22 and a host of other passages which affirm that the child of God can so sin as to be lost, and there is always that danger, and we need to guard against it. If it is not the case that a child of God could so sin as to be lost, much of the New Testament would be meaningless and would be gibberish. But the fact is, we can. And that's one thing he's emphasizing here, the danger of this. Verse 30, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense saith the Lord, quoting from Deuteronomy 32, 35, and 36. And again, the Lord shall judge his people, Psalms 50, verse 4. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. All of that hearkens to mind or brings to our mind final judgment, the final day of judgment, and there will be a final day of judgment coming. Uh, he is connecting this with this particular habitual sin, verse 25, forsaking the assembly, but in the larger picture, it's any sin that we habitually commit. Not just forsaking the assembly, but any sin that we continually commit. If you keep on going back to that sin over and over and over and over and over and over and over, it doesn't matter how many times that you pray to God to be forgiven, there comes a point where it won't be. Because we must demonstrate the attitude and disposition of repentance. And that we're going to give up that sin. And that we're going to live for Christ. We must live according to what the New Testament says. But, verse 32. Call to remembrance the former days. In which after you were illuminated or enlightened. You endured a great fight or conflict of afflictions or sufferings. Partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. And partly whilst you became companions or partakers of them that were so used. Remember what was the case when you first obeyed the truth. You went through a lot of persecution. You went through a lot of suffering because of who you were. Verse 34. For you had compassion of me in my bonds or on them that were in bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance a better possession and an abiding one again that first phrase there in verse 34 brings to mind what the apostle Paul would write about in my bonds or having compassion in my bonds 
This, of course, uh, gives rise to the possibility that Paul, at the very least, was behind this epistle. If he didn't actually write it, that he was right behind the writing of it. Uh, but still, his point was that uh, they were uh, really thinking about the reward that was going to come. And they were not really paying attention to all of the suffering that they were enduring because they knew they had something better waiting for them. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Don't cast away your boldness, in other words, which has great recompense of reward. They were getting now to the point, in contrast to their previous state, they had been going through all of these things for so long that they were growing weary in well-doing. Isn't that all a common temptation for us to grow weary in well-doing? What's it all for? What's the use? You know, we're keeping on getting all this grief and all this suffering and all of this misery. You know, where's the payoff? Sometimes you can get tired. You can get tired of doing right. And yet, he says, don't do that. Don't cast it away, your confidence, your boldness. For, verse 36, you have need of patience. There's that word, endurance. You have need of patience. Oh, and in other words, they've got to keep on pers persevering in spite of what they're enduring. That after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. You need to persist in well-doing. As Paul would say, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Same kind of thought here. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. What's he referring to there in verse 37? Uh, ending persecution. Ending the persecution that they are enduring now. How would that be accomplished? Well, he not, does not say clearly in the text. There are those that would affirm that it was through the destruction of Jerusalem. Everything being defined through the destruction of Jerusalem. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the fact that their suffering, what they're going through, would be taken away from them. If they are patient, if they endure. Now, the just, or my righteous one, shall live by faith. But if any man draw or shrink back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. We've got to be firm. We've got to be resolute. We cannot draw back. How many times over the years have you known of brothers and sisters in Christ who early on were just gung-ho and zealous completely about the work of the Lord? Seemed like they were on fire for the Lord. And then you lose contact for a number of years. And then when you reestablish contact with those uh, brethren, those brothers and sisters, you find out that those brothers and sisters have left the truth. They perhaps have not been attending church in years. They've not been active in church in a long time. And it shocks you, it stuns you. I never will forget when my dad and mom moved back to Walker County after so many years of being gone. Daddy had been preaching in a lot of different places, Arkansas, Indiana, Tennessee, Kentucky. He finally moved back to the state when I was in college, 1984, when they moved back home. And he began preaching at Crossroads there outside of Jasper. He was there for 22 plus years uh, total. And I never will forget him telling me, and I was in college at the time, Freed Hardeman, saying that they had reestablished contact with a couple that were instrumental in encouraging them as young Christians in their early walk in Christ. And they were shocked to find out that this couple that had been so much to them in years gone by had not been faithful to the Lord in about 15 to 20 years, had not darkened the door of the church in all that period of time. And there's a number of reasons for that. And Daddy did his dead-level best to restore that couple back to the truth. And I'd have to ask Mama tonight because I forget whether he was successful in doing that or not. But still, he did his best to try to get them back to the Lord. And it's because, in part, of being weary. Weary and well-doing. You know, getting tired. What's it all for? What's the use? Well, he's talking about that right here. Verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Don't quit. Don't give up. 
One uh, example of not giving up is uh, uh, Bob Sperlin. You may remember Brother Bob Sperlin, who was incapacitated because of a uh, muscular disease for so many years. But the Bob Sperlin preached the gospel from his hospital bed for many years and encouraged so many people by phone calls and cards and different things that he would do from his position. He could have very well have given up on the Lord because the very day that he learned that he had this muscular disease, he found out that his daughter, their daughter, had been killed in an automobile accident. That could have devastated any normal person. Bob was not a normal person. He was faithful to the Lord in everything that he did. And he was persevering to the Lord all his life. We've got to keep on going. We've got to keep on keeping on. And by the way, that verse 39 is a great transition to the next chapter, chapter 11, that great chapter which we will cover next Wednesday night, the heroes of faith, the hall of fame of faith. And that's where we will...